Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. In Alcoholics Anonymous, once I started going to meetings, I couldn't, I couldn't just, uh, and, and I wasn't, I wasn't making myself not drink. In other words, I wasn't fighting alcohol. I wasn't fighting bars or bottles or anything like that. I didn't like billboards and things like that when I seen them, you know, when they had stuff up there pertaining to drinking or anything. Uh, but that was the fear that I had in me all the time, the fear of returning to the life, not the bottle, but the life that I come from, because it was a bad life. It was a hard life. It was a, it damn near killed me. And, uh, so, <clears throat> as I, as I went along here, going to meetings now, it took some time. And it took, it, it took some time to start realizing or start questioning myself. Me, just exactly what what am I doing here? You know, just exactly what am I doing here? I've got a sponsor, and I read the book, big book, twelve by twelve, Sermon on the Mount when it came, and, and Tebow when it came out in fifty seven, things like that. But I never knew that, that, like you're sitting here now, and I don't know if you question any of this or you uh, think about this or anything else like that. But I had to do it, and I, uh, uh, and the reason I had to do it is because I had to find out exactly what happened to me, and what's the matter with me, and why do I have to come to meetings, and why is it always be the bottle, be stay sober, don't get drunk, you know, and, uh, and it's called alcoholism, and I'm not drinking, why is it called that, and why does it have to be called that, and so on. So, there's a lot to talk about, I believe, in Alcoholics Anonymous here. More than just telling you to come here and start putting steps in your life, and I'll start talking to you maybe like I generally do about step one, you know, and step two, or whatever step you want to talk about. Because, you know, this here group here we have here, I think it's a little bit different than most groups. I know it is. And I also know that the message that's here has done a great deal of good in Alki's life that I know personally and probably that I don't know about at all, you know, because the message is the message and it goes on tape, it goes all all over the country, I know that. I have I had a lot of a lot of Alkies call me or tell me that they've listened to these tapes and changed their lives and and uh, never met me yet and I never met them. They're from different states even, you know. But the reason I said that in the beginning about the idea is that I came, when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and I kept going to meetings, I, I stayed sober because you stayed sober. I stayed sober because everybody around me stayed sober. And as I stayed sober, they stayed sober, they stayed like they were, and I stayed like I was. And this I had to look at. I really had to look at. Because of the fact of what it was. If the character that I'm talking to and running with is a mean character and a, and a character that talks rough and tough and speaks, slaughters people and everything else, that's the kind of person I am too because I talk that way too and I think that way too. I act that way and I'm talking about me, especially me, because this is exactly what I did. I ran with a big Hungarian and he was like me and I was like him. And we both did the same things all the thing, all the time. And yet, though, we stayed sober. And never once I ever questioned the fact that how can anybody stay sober that's got a mind like that? Because that mind, <laughs> that mind I had, believe me, man, it was at it all the time. And, it, and, and as I came to these meetings, now, as I sat like you're sitting, I, my thoughts weren't very good thoughts. Now and then they might become good thoughts for something special, but they weren't something that was it was there uh, for me to have, to enjoy, or to use in my life, because I missed it entirely. I missed the whole purpose of coming to Alcoholics Anonymous entirely. And this here, you know, why uh, 
at one time, maybe for you even, you know, in the beginning, at least for me, in the beginning, I wanted to hear, I wanted to hear the drunkalogs. And I wanted to hear all of the things that were going on. There used to be like this Eddie C. out here in North Hollywood when, you know, he used to be the most comical guy there is on this earth, you know. He used to have me rolling in the aisles, you know, about his drunkalogs, you know about how he did certain things, you know. All he did was lay on the floor, pee his pants, and talk to his dog, you know. And I I used to think that was the funniest thing I ever heard, you know. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so <clears throat> I, went, I, I kept going to meetings, like you're going to this meeting right now. And the thing, some of the things I enjoyed, I did enjoy some of the things. I, I did like to hear certain things. And most of the time, there were generally things that came out of the drunken world. And then later on, I got to realizing, you know, and just like maybe you're here, you're, it's Christmas, and maybe you've, you've had a beautiful day because it's a special day, so your mind was special, and your, and your thoughts were special, and your thoughts were good. And people around you showed you love and, and expressed love to you and all that, your family, your kids or whatever. <clears throat> but the character that I was was the same character that I was whether I was drunk or sober. In other words, there was no difference in me. The day made a difference, but only because it was a special day. And then other special days would come. And I would have another day, but it didn't have to be Christmas. It could be buying a new car. It could be for a lot of reasons, see. And never once did I ever realize or ever check or try to find out <clears throat> the purpose of sitting at a meeting like this right now, to come to a meeting like this, whether the room is packed or whether we just got a few. What's just exactly what's going on? What What's the need, see? For me, I'm looking inwardly now, and I'm talking about me and what I had to do. And these are not questions to you, to for you to answer to me, because that, that, it's none of my business. But the main thing is, though, is to realize or try to realize the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous, of why to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and why come to meetings like this, and why not, why not benefit, or why not have a different or a, a better or a, or a way of life that I should have, that I actually should have. Not, it's not the one that I used to have, but the one I should have. Because there's a message here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's a way that it has to be, I, be, I believe, delivered or presented or shown so that it becomes a message of recovery. It becomes a message of Alcoholics Anonymous. It becomes a way of life. Because, you know, I stayed sober for two and a half years, and that two and a half years, the first two and a half years, believe me, when I say I was the same man sober as I was drunk, I mean that. Uh, I used the same mind, the same intelligence, the same thought process, the same way of, of acting or looking at people or anything else like that, and knew yet, though, inside of me that it should be different, but I just couldn't do differently. And I thought that the fact that the meetings, the guys I'm with, and everything else like that, that eventually or someday things will change. And I didn't even know that the purpose even coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, the mere fact of being at a meeting like this, is helping me stay sober, not drink. Just the mere attendance of a meeting like this because of what the, what's, what this stands for. This is a program of recovery. It stands for a program of recovery, not a program of failure. This is not a place you come here to learn how to get drunker. This is not a place here you come that you live in so many yesterdays that the first thing you know you are yesterday again because of the fact of what's here. There's a message here. You know, and this, you know, the, like in step one in, in your 12 by 12 in the first page in there, and the way it's worded and what it says to me, you know, is that I didn't even know that this here is part of what's happening here in Alcoholics Anonymous for me to come here and to start a way of life. To start a way of life that I don't even know that I am doing. I'm starting a way of life. I don't even know I'm doing it. I come here out of a hospital. 
I know none of these words. I know nothing at all about you guys. And yet I'm amongst all of you, and I belong there, and I feel this. I know this. I also know that there's such a thing that there's a power. There's a power greater than any human power. And when this human power is here, meaning all of us, there's something going to take place that will take place. And what it is, it's, it's an energy, it's a force. To really hear what was read tonight, like when what you were reading in, in your steps now, like in step one, it said, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And it says down here, it says, we know that little good can come to any alcoholic who joins AA unless he first accepted his devastating weakness and all of its consequences. Until he so humbles himself, his sobriety of any will be precarious. Of real happiness, he will find none at all. Proved beyond doubt by the immense experience, this is one of the AA facts of, of the AA life. Well, you know, when I was in that hospital, you know, I couldn't figure out how come I got in that hospital. I couldn't figure out why they strapped me down on the bed. And I could, you know, and at, after I got out of that hospital, I could accept the fact that I can't drink alcohol. I could accept that fact. And I didn't even know that I could accept it. But the drunken life, or the way of life, I didn't know what that was. So the fact is that I was a scared. I wasn't scared of alcohol. I'm not scared of alcohol. I, I really love the damn stuff. You know, I love the smell of it. I love the cork. But I don't love the life it presents, or the life that it gives me, or makes me behave, or do like and that's what it means in here when it says, until I accept my most devastating weakness and all of its handy, and all of its weaknesses and the handicap of it, why, the fact that going to meetings was the, was the thing that I didn't realize what was happening to me. That I was really doing something now that I should do. I should hang around people that are sober. Instead of going sitting in a bar somewhere and sucking on a Coke, thinking in terms I can find happiness, fun there, and everything else, and I can get away with it by sucking on a coat. And I found out that this is what the purpose of the steps and the meetings for, is to start to identify or start to show you and me, each other, as a whole, as a one, collectively speaking, that we're all here for the same reason. And it isn't a question of staying sober. It's a question of not needing to get drunk. And there's a big difference here. Now, what I'm talking about, because I don't know this stuff. So I think in terms that the longer I stay away from the bottle, this is the way I used to think, the longer I stay away from the bottle, the safer I'll be, the better off I'll be. Never once ever known that if there isn't something done about my mind where the disease of alcoholism is, that I'm going to have to do another repeat performance that I'm going to have to return to that bar. And because of the fact that I haven't accepted this, and this means that at a meeting like this right now, when we're talking when we're talking about the disease of alcoholism, it's not a disease now I'm going to talk about and talk about how drunken, fallen down drunk or drunken smashing drunk, far drunk or anything else like that kind of a drunk. But I'm going to talk about a program of recovery about a way of living, a way of life that's guaranteed to each one of us. Each one of us guaranteed. The reason it's guaranteed is because it's already established. It's already here for that purpose. This is not something that you're going to take now and walk out the door and then figure out yourself what the wording means, whatever that wording is in here. And the steps... It's proven the program recovery is 12 steps. The reason it's proven that way is because meetings, these meetings don't keep you sober. These meetings here are here for a reason, but they're not to keep you sober. They're here so that we can have what's needed to keep us sober. This is the message. This message is a way of life. This message that I'm talking about has to be, I believe, considered for what it really is, it's a way of life. It's something to do, and it's something to do today, this day, now. Now, I don't know how many of you 
had this day start whenever it started up till this very moment. And I don't know how much of whatever you've seen out of your eyes that you've seen that maybe possibly that, uh, that you could criticize or find fault or maybe you could see it and wish it was changed or something different or whatever it is like that. But I had, but I had to learn that this here, what I just got through saying, is a step application. It's a principle. And it's a principle that I can't go to self. I can't talk to self. I can't go to self and say to self, this has been a lousy day. Yeah. Something happened at work, maybe, or on a stage or someplace like that. And it upset me. And it's a lousy day. And I have to go talk about it somewhere. And then I go somewhere and I talk about it and I keep it alive. And yet, though, here in Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> there's a way of life. And this way of life is already established in principle and application. So that all of us, any of us, the things that are going on in our life, they don't control our life. They don't make our life go deeper. The bottom of the barrel, I used to live in the bottom of the barrel all the time. The reason why is I talked about it all the time. I always talked about the misery, the pain. I always talk about the whining, whining all the time. All I could see all the time was trouble, trouble. So I talked about it. And as I talked about it, I lived it. As I lived it, I became more of that person than the person I should be. Here in this meeting here right now. <clears throat> now, you know, like a, a lot of you have been here for a long time. <clears throat> I don't know how many, but it hasn't been very many nights that we've had meetings here where somebody has been allowed to be up here and moan and groan and talk about the drunken world, the drunken life, the yesterdays. It hasn't been very many. There's been a couple. and There's been a couple. But not too many. Not too many. Well, the reason, I believe the reason, is that each and every one of us are here to get well, not to get sicker. Each and every one of us knows that there's a message there's a program of recovery. There's a way of life. There is something here at this room, in this meeting, that's necessary, it's needed. And this is what I, that I believe the message should be carried and talked about for each of us. Because I know I can carry so much to some, somebody, but I, that's all. That, and I'm only one. But there's many, many out there that I know today, this day, today, this day, a day I like this day that they wish they had never been born. I know that because I've had them days at this time of the year, Christmas. I've had them days a long time ago, drunk, that I tore everything apart there is to tear apart. And this here I know for sure is the disease of alcoholism. This is all about this message I'm talking about here in Alcoholics Anonymous, that we can have here a way of life, a way of life. It's already here, written. It's already proven. And the only thing wrong with this book here is that sometimes I don't know how to read it. I don't know how to apply what I read. I don't know how to put into my life from print something that's needed so desperately, badly in my, in my life today. I don't know how to do it. I had to do, I had to do everything by trial and error a long time ago. I had to trial and error things all the time. And then it came a time when I found out that trial and error was all right. Because when I found out that there's something to keep, I would keep it. And I was even taught by one alcoholic in particular that when he was teaching me about step seven, he said, if you find that this would add anything at all to your life, he said, you'd be a fool to throw it away. And he was true. What he said was true. And I didn't throw it away. I kept it. And I used it, and I started to live by it. I started to apply my life by it. I started to use a mind function in that day, trying to do and trying to be someone now, so I can contribute to life, so I can help my fellow man. Because that's exactly what it says, that I have to do, have to help my fellow man, and I have to do God's will. So this is, this is why, like tonight, this night, there's so many things to say. You could say, you know, you can talk forever because this is a lifetime living life. 
Alcoholics Anonymous is a lifetime proposition. It's not a daily thing. It's not a thing that you do occasionally. It's not a thing that you do at work and then don't do it at home or something like that. This is a complete change of character of today's life for me as the alcoholic. For you, I have no idea. I don't know what you need. I haven't even a clue. But I do know what I need. I do know what I need and how to think wherever I'm at. Wherever I'm at. I know I want to I wanna be somebody that God wants me to be. And the principles are here in steps, all of them. I take great pride inside of myself, inside of me, in a relationship with God. I take great pride the way my mind functions, the way it thinks, the way I act, how I think of another person, how I really can show somebody else I care for them, how this world that I live in is not a rat race world. Now, you know, like I know, there could be a lot of days for me and you that these days could be bad days. They could be. Bad in the sense of, of upsetting you so severely that you, you just get all torn up inside. Or you get so fearful inside. Maybe a bill, so not being able to pay your bills or having an income great enough that you see doomsday coming. Man, I used to see doomsday coming all the time, man. I had a hell of a time with that doomsday. Because of the fact that I was always thinking in terms that I'll never be able to make it. I'll never be able to make it. It's too much. I just don't have that kind of money. And things like that. And then I would be inside of myself. I'd be so wrapped up, and so caught up with my thoughts that I felt terrible. I felt sick inside of my stomach. And this, this what I'm talking about, doesn't make any difference if I had, if, if I owned something or didn't own it. It was a happening that happened to me that shouldn't happen to me, but it was happening to me. It's the same thing as, as, as like today, this day today. I don't know if any of you have any troubles that way like I used to have. I used to have great troubles this way. And I had, looking at the future, I was always looking at the future. I was always looking at the dollar, the dollar sign. I was always looking to see the end result. I always wanted an end result. And almost every alky I ever met so far today, this day, wants an end result. They want a finished product. They want the end of something to be so it's over with and done with and they get rid of it and that's gone. That's a way of thinking that I used to use and I had to learn how not to think like that. And the only way that I learned how not to think like that is by an application of steps. And this means about in step two and three. When I made a decision in three to turn my will of my life over to care of God as I understood him, he took everything that I have in me, and that meant my thinking, because that's where my will is. My will is in my thinking. He took my will. And my life. My life is what I do. My life has been dedicated. I've been disciplined. I've been dedicated to carrying this message to God for many, many years. And this is something that's so, that to me is so special. It's so needed. Because why should any one of us, anyone, I don't give a darn who you are, why should you be so fearful? Or why should you have something inside of you that's tearing you apart? And yet it's in you. It's not out of you. And yet you think it's out of you. Because it's your mind. And it's your mind thinking about the future. It's your mind thinking maybe about dollar signs. It's what I used to do all the time. And here's what I'm talking about now. Coming to a meeting like this meeting here. And just to, to talk about what? What, would, what, what? what do we normally talk about? What do, we, what do I generally say, or what do I generally talk about? Talk about a way of life today. Why can't it be the way it should be today, no matter how, how, how far down I am or how far up I am, meaning either in money or health or anything else like that? Why can't it be a good life today or a life complete today under the grace of God? It can. It will, and it is. 
because of the fact that that's what we were talking about before the meeting. The bottom line, on this what I'm talking about, the bottom line is always the grace of God. But you see, to have this, to talk about this, I think that it has to be identified and recognized in Alcoholics Anonymous when we come in here. There is something here. I knew there was something here. My sponsor was a stepman, a god man. He always talked about, but for the grace of God, there go I. He was always, always a kind man. He was always a man, always, never, he didn't get mad, excited, swear, and cuss like I did, and things like that. But he had, he had something I didn't have. And when I walked into a room like this here, I never once ever coupled the thought that there's other people like my sponsor in this room. And these other people that are in the room are carrying with them a power that they believe in, they trust. They also call him God. And that also makes this meeting here, this meeting, a meeting like it should be under the grace of God. Because how many, how many of us, how many, how, how, how could any of us correct anything in yourself? I couldn't do it. I tried it. Page 45 in the big book said, lack of power is my dilemma. But how was I to find that power? That's what this book is about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about finding a power, and the power is God. It says, now we're going to talk about God. But you see, that is what I mean by a living God, a God that's here in my life, helping me, guiding me, directing me, powering me. But he's also here because I ask him to be with all of us, with all of us, with you also, whoever you are. These are the things that I never recognized of why Alcoholics Anonymous has the power it has. Why individuals can come like me, can come to Alcoholics Anonymous, can come to meetings like this. And if you said God, I'd shut the word right out. But I didn't shut God out, though. He's still here. And I don't know this, though, see. So I go along two and a half years. I won't even say the Lord's Prayer. I just won't say it because I didn't want to. I said I wasn't going to do it, and I didn't do it. But for two and a half years, I stayed sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, going to meetings like this here. Listen to speakers. Some of them are good, some are bad. I was there, though. How come? How come I stayed sober? Did I keep me out of bars? Did I stop me from getting drunk? The last two years of my of my drinking, I had one day, imagine, one day without alcohol. Now, see, I believe that this here has to be talked about because I'll tell you why. I was so scared of the word God. I was so scared of it that I didn't want to hear you talk about it. And all through the steps and all through the program recovery and everything that Bill Wilson teaches even in the language of the heart is all about God. He had to find the same thing. It took him longer, but he still had to find the same thing. He had to find a relationship that we were talking about. A relationship with the power that he learned to call God also. This is in print, now what I'm saying. This is in writing. This is out of his own words, right in this book right here. And this is why on this meeting here tonight, that... To talk about steps, you guys, I, I know I know you know steps. I know you know what I'm going to say. I don't know if you live them. It's none of my business. I don't know if you want to hear more about them. That's none of my business either. But I'll tell you this, that the steps is the program recovery. At this meeting here, there's no reason why any and all of us, why we can't have everything that we need to know in the day we're in so that we can live with the grace of God because it's in the step application. I never knew that this year's step, these steps, was the way of life that presented to every one of us. There's a lot of reading looking in here. Don't go into the stories. Go to the 164 pages. I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot in here. See? And there's a lot in here. And living in the day I'm in, this day, today, I could take any one of these pages 
that I'm talking about. And I can read. And I can find a way of life for me today to use for a way of life. And I never knew that. I thought that you had to do is you had to remember pages or remember steps or numbers or remember this or that or something like that. I didn't know that I could live today because the character is built on step application. So whatever is needed will be applied because that is the step application. Man, I couldn't hear a message like that for no money. You know that, I don't know, did you, was, was that clear what I said? Was that clear for you? Because see, for me, a long time ago, that wouldn't be very clear at all. In other words, I would listen to you say these words, I would close the book, but I'd go out in that world out there and I'd do my thing. Because I just left the meeting and because I know what it says. But I didn't live it out there. I couldn't live it out there. I don't know how to live it out there. I know how to do me, but I don't know how to do this. So this here, like tonight, to have a message for all of us and know that today, this day, this message is a program of recovery. It's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the message I've had now in my life now for over 43 years. My sponsor, when he died, he had 30 years of it. And see... To talk about this now like I normally do, like I say, tell you about step two, you know, I came to leave with a power greater than self, and then I explain about the self-talk and then different things, and then three. Well, see, I believe to talk about this, what I'm talking about, stops relapses, makes this meeting here a meeting that you come here, sat here, and when you leave here, you don't need to go down to that bar down there and start to argue with somebody on there or something like that. I believe that the power of God is in the message. And the power of God is here, here, in this room tonight, for each and every one of us. And that's why this meetings, all of these meetings, any of these meetings, why I went to this meeting for so long a time, stayed sober, and didn't have to get drunk. When before that, I had to be drunk. I had to drink. It was necessary to drink. I just had to drink. That's all there was to it. Then all of a sudden, it wasn't there. There's so much to talk about. You know yourself for look for yourself, each one of you individually, because you know a great deal. You do know a great deal about your life, about the way you think, the way you act, the life you live, the way you go in the day you're in. Self honesty to self that we talked about needed. So why not benefit from each other's experience? Why not benefit from each other's life? It's a message. It's a program of recovery. It's the purpose of being here. So we can maybe tonight, we can talk about however you want to talk about it. Whatever you, individually. Now we should, we should, each of us, we should add something to this. Whatever it is you think you need to add. If the question, it's a question. But at least know that we're here for the same reason. That's all. How about somebody, yes, sir, Larry? My name is Larry, and I am an alcoholic, Larry. real alcoholic. I just, you know, I just want to share that, you know, I had like a really beautiful day today. You know, I didn't. Uh, you know, it's it's the gift of this program and of this message that Bob carries. It's in the Big Book of Alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous, because I could never hear this message. You know, like Bob was talking, you know, application. You know, I never even heard that before. I came to this meeting and heard Bob talking about uh, application of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. All I heard was working the steps. And what I thought that was is you read them, you wrote down what, was, what your problems were, and all the crap that you went through, and you went to this sponsor of yours and you shared it with him and you're done you're done with them you're, you're done you worked them steps uh, and you paid back people that you owed and if you couldn't pay them back you were willing to pay them back and that was a nice soft shoe to wear 
and that, um, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, then, then all of a sudden you came to the spiritual awakening and you had God in your life. And, you know, and that's what I thought I had. You know, I came here because I prayed and I did, you know, service work and I, you know, and I had sponsors and I had a sponsor. And I, you know, and I did all that stuff. But, um, I kind of found out that's not what it was about because what was happening was that, um, I still had to, I had untreated alcoholism because I gave God the alcohol and the, the drugs in my life. But, you know, I, I, I still ran the show. I, you know, I remember thinking it clearly. You know, God, God's good for that, but, you know, I really need to take, take care of this stuff today. You know, my girlfriend or my job. You know, I got to take care of this stuff right now. And, you know, God's really not too concerned about, you know, what I do here and there. But, um, the reality of that was it drove me to the point where I want to blow my brains out, you know, in sobriety. Or drink. And, you know, drinking, you know, that's a death warrant. You know, what Rob talks about. And, uh, I never knew about application. Because I thought I was working the steps. I had worked the steps. I, in fact, I had done three. I had three different spots. I, and I had done three different, uh, fourth and fifth steps. And, um, and still I was angry, restless, irritable, and discontented. I'd see people, and I'd want to kill them for no reason. I mean, I just want to get into a little scenario in my head, because they pissed me off. I looked at them, they were doing something. I didn't think they should. And this program of recovery, which is a program of recovery today, as opposed to a program of getting by. You know, I'm getting by in life, and everything's good. I got money in my pocket. I got a girlfriend, uh, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the reality is, is that I can go so far in the day I'm in, and then the world has just pushed me too far. The world has just done a little bit too much. You know, they just crossed that line. I've had enough of this shit. They can kiss my ass. You know? And, uh, and I'm, and I'm basically, uh, basically not a happy camper, you know? You know, I got my good moments and I got my bad moments, you know, and that's life, you know? And I'm hearing things throughout the program. I'm hearing, you know, you know, turning my whole life and will over to care of God, and having a spiritual experience. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, that's not for me though. That's for, you know, spiritual giants. You know, I, I'm really uh, new here. Or I'm going to get it later on. You know, ten years down the line. You know? um, and I'm in the meantime, I'm seeing people with long-term sobriety going out and drinking. People with long-term sobriety blowing their brains out. I'm saying, man, you know, what's all this about? You know, and, and I can't put it together, though. I just can't put it together. But I get here and I and I hear this, you know, and, and I, you know, I've been coming around these rooms for about a year and a half now, listening to Bob and Ted and, and all you guys, and you know, and it's it's clear as day and night to me today what application is. This means I got to live like a decent human being today. I don't have no more excuses for getting pissed off at people. I have no excuses for getting pissed off at whoever I'm going out with. I have no excuses for getting pissed off at my neighbors or anybody. I have no, I can't, I can't excuse that behavior no more. Uh, I can see, living that other way, I could excuse it. I always had a reason. They did this. So, screw them. They, uh, cut me off. I can cut them off. And I could always blame it on you. You know, and what this does, this tells me I can't do that. Who I have to blame it on, who I have to look at is me. I'm the one that's getting pissed off. I'm the one that's saying, you're not acting right. I'm the one that's saying, uh, I'm not getting my fair share and I need more. This is all going on up here. And what I'm finding out, that's, uh, that's the infantile ego that is never satisfied. That is always screaming out like this. And, but what about mine? You know, it's, what about mine? How come I don't have mine? And that's my infantile ego screaming at me. And it screams at me. And it makes me upset. And it makes me full of fear. And it, and it throws fear in my way. And I get fearful. And then so what I do, I react. I go out and I get in the world and I push and shove. And I think I got to get more. And I think I got to get my fair share. And all that does is upset me in the day I'm in. And it, and it really, it, it ruins the day that I'm, I'm living, and if I'm if it ruins the day I'm living, it's ruining my life. You know? Because come to find out, I'm living today. I'm not living for something that's going to happen three, four years from now, or two weeks, 
or I don't, and I'm not living in the past. You know, I don't have to go back and live in the past. Man, I mean, I know I've heard people up here talking about, Vince last week was talking about he was sitting in his chair at home, thinking about he should have done that song, bitch, you know, and he had a chance to do it, man. And then he realized the guy's been dead for 10 years. And he's all upset about something that happened to him. And I've done that myself. I know I've done that. I've been, I find myself pissed off and angry about something that happened 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 5 years ago. And these people aren't even in my life anymore, you know. And I'm living in the past, you know. And that's not application. That's not this program of recovery. What that is, is that's a program of Larry. Poor Larry, you know. Uh, that's a program of, uh, that Larry, there too. <laughs> this is a program, this is a program of recovery and it's application today, right now. I had a great day. My, um, people I rent from called me up this morning, invited me up for breakfast, made me breakfast, gave me this shirt. Uh, I went out to a meeting, a noon meeting with a friend of mine. We went over there and, uh, Ended up working with a couple of newcomers, gave away a 12 and 12, and you know, just stuff like that. I went down and hung out with the hobos down on, on Santa Monica, on the uh, beach down there. You know? And they were smiling and happy and one wishing them Merry Christmas and all that stuff, shaking their hands. And, um, you know, I just went to another meeting just before I came here. And, uh, I had, we had dinner over there and stuff like that. I just had like this. And it just doesn't stop. And, and, and my days are always good today. And, you know, and I do catch myself, um, getting in the way. You know, I do catch myself doing that. But, um, I don't stay there no more. I've got a place to go, and it's in this program. You know, it's a program of recovery. I got a program of recovery to go to that guarantees me a way of life that I can be happy, joyous, and free. And, uh, that's with, with a God. You know, I gotta go to God. I gotta have this God in my life. You know, I came in here, I didn't, you know, like Bob talks about, I didn't have a God. I might have had a God, but, you know, it was a God that I was taught as a child, and I really, I didn't have a God. I had me when I came in here. Today I have a God I go to every morning. I go to every morning. And I, if I don't go to God every morning, and there was a morning not too long ago that I didn't go to God. I had a phone call from this woman friend of mine, and she got my mind thinking on something else. And, you know, I was into the day for two or three hours before I realized that I was out of control and I was living in alcoholism. And I had to get right back to God. But I go to God all the time today. Cause that's, that's the only thing that can, um, that's the only way I can live in this world. Cause I can't live with me. I cannot live with me. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, either I'm dead or I'm drunk or I'm living with God. And the reality is, is the, the world that God has for me is, um, is limitless. It's beautiful and it's limitless. You know, uh, you know, what, what, what can happen to me in the day that I'm in is beyond anything I could ever plan on what, it ha- what I could happen for me. But if I go to me, my world is real limited. It's what's in this fearful little black hole I got in the back of my brain. And, and it tells me how terrible everything is. And, you know, I, I can't live in that world. I can't live. I don't want to live in that world. And I don't have to. I got a program of recovery right here where I can live. And I can live a good life. And I can be happy, joyous, and free. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. Merry Christmas. Um, I, Bob, I was going to ask you a question. Um, regarding, you know, I always remember you, uh, you talking about uh, surrender as being a state of mind, a state of heart. You know, and, and the last couple of days, I just happened to be listening to a tape uh, where you're talking about Tebow too, and, and about surrender versus compliance. So the, the question is, is, is can you talk a little bit about that? That what you mean by by that surrender is being a state of mind, and and how 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 that what Tebow talks about for us in surrender versus compliance, and what that all means in application. You know the uh, the part about surrender versus compliance. Uh, at first, I had to I had to read and learn more about exactly what they're talking about, because I have no idea myself, in living the life that I live, uh, the difference between surrender and compliance. Now, because I can't, the way I looked at it, and the way I thought about it, was that certain things 
that you surrendered. In other words, you stopped doing. You turned it in. You just didn't do it no more. And compliance, uh, meant, to me, meant complying was going in the day I was in and functioning that day and doing that day, everything that I thought was necessary that day as I lived my life that day. Uh, you see, I didn't really see this for what, what it really is. And, uh, and so the, the character that I brought here, see, the character I brought here was an argumentative character. It was a character that always picked and choose and are quarreled and found fault and uh, would do things under certain conditions and other things I, I certainly wouldn't do, you know. And I didn't know the, who I really was, see, and, and about who I, the way I look at life and people and things. So I always picked and choose. Now, I would do things, sometimes I would do things uh, because there's something in store for it. And for me, there's some benefit that if I do this, I can have something from doing this. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've got, I can draw from it. I can, and... Uh, the uh, the surrender to me always meant the same thing. Now I know what surrender means. Or I used this is the way I used to be. See, I used to think that surrender was when you quit. See, when you quit, when you give up. Now the way I learned that, I learned that in bars fighting. I learned that with riding motorcycles and going out and get on, get on doing certain things on the track or doing things like that. See, is that. You better surrender. In other words, you better quit that, see, because you're going to get your head knocked off or some damn thing's going to happen. So the state of mind or the state of life that I had at the time was always governed by either surrender or compliance. One minute I'm, I'm wishy-washy. One minute I can do something this, I'll gladly do it for you. The next thing you ask me, I ain't never going to do that or have nothing to do with that, period. And that, I don't know the character that I am. He is built like that. I look at life the way I look at life, see, is generally in my favor. If it's in my favor, I'll, I'll do it. But if it isn't in my favor, see, then I might do it if I have to do it. But it's going to be a, 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 like a, like half, the half attempt at it. Or I'm going to do it under protest. Now I learned how to do things under protest. That means working, that means at home, that means everywhere. Because that's the way I evaluated everything I did in my life. See, is if, if it was important, if, if it was for my ego, if, uh, if it was the boss and he wanted me to do something, uh, right away I'd shine, right away I'd do it, you know, because I'm gonna look good in his eyes, you know. Now what I'm doing though, I don't want to do it, and I don't like to do it, and when he's gone, I ain't gonna do it. But, Surrender versus compliance is a state of mind that I had to learn the difference between the two. And for me, so that I have surrendered. When I surrender, I don't mean a surrender to a bottle. I didn't surrender to AA. I didn't surrender my job or a part of my job or part of my home or part of my driving or something like that. I surrendered a mind, a way of life. I surrendered the power of self to God so that the application now is not in quarrel. That I'll give the very best shot I got at everything and anything I do. I won't do things half no more. I won't do things under protest no more. I'll give my best shot in the day I'm in. The day I'm in, I'm going to do the very best I can do. I'm going to give 100% of what I got, not 100% of 100%, 100% of what I got. I'm going to give an effort, and the effort I'm going to give is the best I can give. That's the very best I can give. So you see, this is a state of mind. This is a way of living. This is a way of life, so that I don't have to do the things when I used to hate to have to do something. I didn't want to do it. And then most of the time, the effort I put out was very minimal, or it was very, it was, it was more to get it done, get it passed, get it out of the way. How it turns out, I don't give a damn. Just get it out of the way. 
that's the way I thought. I do not live like that. I don't think like that. And I had to learn that this here, what you're talking about, compliance versus surrender, means everything to me. And when you yourself personally realize your own performance in the day you're in is governed by that, then you're going to look at that maybe a little different. Now, surrender isn't a condition of giving up. Surrender isn't just throwing the towel in. That's not surrender. Surrender is exactly what I need to know. It's a surrender of the old, or me, or you, if it's you doing it. And it's a beginning of the new, the new character, the purpose of being here. The surrender is an ending of the old. But it's a beginning of the new. The new meaning character building. The new meaning, I have something behind me now I never had before. No matter what it is, I'm going to give my best shot. I'm backed up by a power I call God. I'm backed up by a prayer that I'll offer to this God to help me do, be, whatever it is that's going on right now, right now at this podium here. I want to speak your words, Lord. Help me, guide me, direct me, power me. With your words, not mine. I don't have any words. What should I say? But if I believe and trust in a power, if I use that power, I can depend on that power. I don't have to think. I don't have to surrender anything. I've given God everything that I possibly can give him. I give him my will of my life. Now it's up to me to perform the correct use now of my will is in alignment with his will. This is what I do all the time. This is the way I live. Whether you believe that or not, it makes a difference to me. But you see, I do have a power. And this power is greater than me, and I choose to call him God. He's a Lord. He's a Lord of my life. A Lord because he's over everything. That's not just a name. That means he's the Lord. He controls everything, everything. Everything that I possibly can offer to my God, I do. This is this is a God consciousness that I talk about. But this isn't nothing about, this doesn't make me, this isn't religion, this don't make me a Jesus freak. What this does, it allows me to see the purpose of 12 steps and why each and every one of them says what it says and why step two qualifies me for step three. Man, do you realize if step two wasn't in there, I couldn't do step three? When three says, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. How could that be if step two wasn't there? How could it be? It couldn't be. See, because I always believe in me. I always talk to me. I'm, I'm the power that runs my life. It says I came to believe in a power greater than me to restore me to sanity. That's why this year, this business now, what you're talking about, Charlie, has to be looked at. But you, you have to look at it. And the way you have to look at it, I believe, with self-honesty in self, to see now, these were things I had to do. I had to question my behavior. I had to question my thoughts. I had to question everything I did in the day I was in to see if I am the man that God says I'll be or am I the man that I say I'll be. See, this is important. See, my life's important to me. Whether this is important to any of you, who knows? If it says this in print, I'm going to believe it because it's already there in print to believe. Somebody didn't tell me this. Somebody didn't say to me, here, I'll tell you what the, this book means. But I told you before, trial and error is what I used to do. This is not trial and error. This is a sure hit every time. This is a belief and a trust and a power greater than any human power that God could and would if he were sought. That's what it says. All of this, well, what the purpose of this meeting right now and the question you asked, believe me, that's a, that's a question that should be asked. Not only should it be asked, but you should start repeating now in your own mind if, if, if you were like me. Just exactly. 
When is the surrender? Is it an ending and then a beginning? Or is it just an ending and never a beginning? That's what I used to do. I used to do the same thing. I used to stop doing certain things, but I wouldn't do other things. There was no beginning. There was an ending because there had to be an ending. I had to back down. I had to learn how to back down from arguments, from from conflict with somebody or or find fault. I had to learn how to back down, how to say, I'm sorry. But I really wasn't sorry inside. I did that because I had to do that. See? And that's that compliance. See? To have this here way of life, every, every one of us, believe me, it's all here. Because if it's went this long, over 60 years, and has not been changed. These are the same, the same steps, same, the same wording. Then they must be all right to be able to say, this is the truth. Hi, Merry Christmas. I'm Peter. I'm an alcoholic. Compliance versus surrender. Thanks for running that by. Uh, Bob, you've gone by that a lot of times, and uh, it just is real significant to me. Today I was over at Doug's house earlier this morning. I had a, had a little brunch, and there was some, uh, some of the guests there. And Anyway, there was a couple that was involved in education, and they were part of the local school district. And uh, I got talking with them in a conversation, and... Uh, there was that argumentative part of me that came in to say what I thought about what it was that they were doing and also about the school district, and uh, I was upset. And uh, the best thing I could do at the time uh, was to be able to leave the place. So I did, got up, thanks, and uh, I split. And uh, anyway, I've carried that with me the rest of the day because um, – First off, it's not the feeling that I want to have. It's not a feeling that I want to have in my recovery. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if I have any expectations that things are going to be dandy, you know, that kind of threw a monkey wrench into it today. And, uh, you know, this is a special day being, being Christmas. And in the past, I've always looked at other people that were handling the monkey wrench, but I found today that I had a monkey wrench of my own. And anyway, that was what I tossed into the pot. So uh, as far as the, you know, when it comes down to the surrender uh, versus compliance, uh, that's the part that I have to look at. I have to look at uh, the program and especially as far as my thinking to, you know, have to surrender, to have an ending to it and to have a new beginning because that's what it's all about. And that's what the recovery is all about. Otherwise, I can only tailor things to the way I want them to be. Um, you know, listening to Bob talking about his experience with God or, uh, you know, uh, not even wanting to hear the word or, you know, be around people that mentioned it. Um, in a way, I was the same way because it was I was built on the same self-will. And I would have God in my life, but it was only God in my life on my terms. And uh, it might have been a partnership of me and God, but it was me and God versus the rest of you. So, uh, and I would keep that partnership as long as it worked for me. And then when it didn't, I'd find another partner. That was the way that my alcoholism was, you know, alive and well in my mind from the um, time I was a teenager before that. Uh, it's just really good to, you know, it's interesting because I've uh, just started reading uh, the Sermon on the Mount in earnest. And I've gone and I've bought those books and taken them around as a literature person. And I'm finally beginning to read it myself. And also on the, going through the Tebow papers of uh, taking them apart and uh, making sure that other people had their copies and their, their editions of this work. And, uh, you know, that's part of that compliance that I can do what it is that I think needs to be done, that I can get by with doing something, and that that's in a way almost like good enough. But, it, you know, it's like it's not that I'm a cannot. It's like I will not. I want to do it. 
my way. And I want to do it on my terms, that I keep wanting to set the terms of what my recovery is going to be all about. And as long as I keep setting the terms, I'm not going to have any. And uh, that's what it comes down, is to finish that way of thinking, to call it quits, to say, that's it, it doesn't work. And here it is, Christmas Day, and I'm not around the people that I used to blame. And uh, I'm just with myself. And uh, for any discomfort I feel today, uh, I don't have to look any further than my own mind. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you. I'm Nadir Avakon. Merry Christmas, everybody. Especially Bob. Um, you know, I was uh, praying this morning. I was asking him, you know, I said, be with me, God. And then I started laughing. I realized that he always with me. I'm not with him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the problem is right here. You know, I had a sound mind today. And then I was uh, driving up here from San Pedro. I was thinking that, you know, if, uh, if sobriety means soundness of mind, I haven't been sober that long, even though I had many years. <laughs> you know, then I realize what you talk about, you know, what you really talk about here. You know, and, you know, you always talk about that two and a half years. You know, I had two and a half years, and my mind just was crazy, and I went out. I mean, you found it. I went out and I drank. And um, for six years, you know, I couldn't feel my skin until I walked into this this room, this special room downstairs, you know. And that, I was reborn. I think that was my faith. And this is only by the grace, grace of God, I, you know. I was just like you too. You, you used to call it luck, you know. But, you know, you you teach me there is no such thing as luck. You know, it was meant to be, and I'm here, and I'm living it, and today I accept this way of life. You know, you were talking, your pitch was different tonight, and, you know, it was refreshing. I needed it. You know, you were talking about living this way of life and not recognizing that you are living this way of life, you know. You don't have to come up here and talk about the things that you did different today, because you are a different man. Therefore, you don't have to talk about it. You just live it. You know, you don't have to prove nothing to anybody anymore. Um, you know, that self-honesty that you talk about. Um, I, you know, the, the reason why our colleagues laugh a lot in speaker meetings is because they can identify with that untreated alcoholism side so much. You know, they still, with 20 years of sobriety, the guy loved that drunk a lot. I did. You know, but anytime you're talking about the treatment of your d- disease, about the self, Self-honesty, the alcoholism, the ego, you know, some people go like, what? Or some people that most in these rooms, they are keen. They, they want to know more, you know, like the question you had and the effect of it, you know. It's amazing, you know, like I'm talking like this even, you know. <laughs> That's the most amazing thing to me. It's just these changes that, you know, I was willing to go through. I was willing to let go of the old character, you know, because I don't want to be that man. My, my life is very important today, you know. Years ago, I used to go to this um, step study meeting, and any time, you know, we opened up a page, a big book, you know, and read it, everybody would come up, and after, after reading the couple of pages, everybody would share. Everybody would say, it's amazing, I'm right there. And I'm doing, they were talking about me in the book. It's just because, you know, these were all principles, and I had no idea that what we were reading were principles. They were principles, and we weren't applying it. Therefore, you know, we needed it. Whatever book, we, whatever page, they would read. Everybody was, oh, I'm right there. You know, I was right there. I needed those words. And and I thought, you know, wow, what a miracle. I walked in, and they were talking about that, you know. It was meant to be. I didn't know that all these pages, that's like this man always talks about, are full of principles. You know, today I know. Today I know what I'm reading, I slow down. I can't read, just just like read, you know. I just go one word at a time because you know, I don't want to miss nothing. I don't know, it's a special day. It's a very uh, special day and I look at it uh, with the truth of being such a special day today. Um, it's not about, you know, other things that, you know, run around and, you know, go shopping and, uh, you know, go crazy. anymore. It's a... It's a good day, you know, I spent it with my mother and my brothers, and it was a good day, and I drove up here, and I'm home, 
you know, it's you know, tomorrow is a new day, and you know, like, um, you know, I today is, is a day that you know I really want to you know to to express my gratitude about the life I have and about the cause of it, and you know, like um, like putting you know, this man in our life. I, you know, I'm grateful for that because you know, he's a special man, and you know, um. The message that he talks about has been a message that has been talked about for thousands of years by greatest man on earth, you know. But we are alcoholics. You see, I can't let my brain go back to the philosophers. <laughs> you know, I have alcoholism, dude. You know, this book is written for me. And this way of life is for me. I can't philosophize it. I can't um, uh, get into this um, argumentative mind because I'm very smart. I'm too smart for my own self. You know, my best thinking got me here. So I better sit down and listen and learn and live and live and live. And I love this life, you know, because you, know, you can't really transmit this thing. And doors will open up. I mean, doors open up. I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of this. And uh, again, Merry Christmas to all. You know, my character, my normal character is not a giver. Uh, uh, I did all my Christmas shopping yesterday. <laughs> Mainly because as December was coming in, I, I was saying to myself, well, well, I don't believe in Christmas anyway. So, uh, well, I can't afford to buy other people gifts, you know. Not in the uh, 30-some years I've been living, so. You know, and it's the same lie I buy every Christmas. And, and then things start popping in my brain all during the last week. I heard Bob say in my mind that, that if, I, if I always, if I gave somebody $5, I thought I'd be $5 short. And I remember him saying that. <laughs> That if you love somebody, you know, I guess he was speaking of your ex-wife, give them the flowers now while they are still alive. All those thoughts kept coming into my brain, and I made a change, you know, and I surrendered, and, and that was true what Bob said. I surrendered, and I didn't do nothing. I went shopping. And <laughs> And, you know, I don't, you know, I spent money for the people I love, and I gave them gifts, and I thought I was going to feel like I had holes in my pockets, <laughs> you know, and I don't, you know, that's, that's a good feeling. I'm not, I'm not sure. I thought, uh, I thought I'd be sure, and it's, it was scary to, to move from one character to the next, and, and you know, and believe in, in the power because I thought I was the source for my, for everything. I thought I was provided for me. So I don't want to be without, so don't give. But I'm learning that, you know, like you said, step two, the power is not me, it's God. Thank you. Hi, I'm James. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, sitting here shaking. I'm having, like, um, I think it's a spiritual experience. Then it's, you know, like, not even my turn. And, uh, I thought I, just before I came into the meeting, I called home, you know, to wish my, uh, my family a happy birthday. And I have a younger brother, 13 months apart. And, uh, we have most, since I remember, since we were little kids, we have battled and beaten each other up. You know, we've, we've, the only relationship we've had, we've had has been full of expletives and things like that. And, uh, about six years ago, he got a string of, a DUIs. He, he, I guess he took it up as a hobby or something like that. And, and he, they sent him to AA. And he's been agnostic his whole life. You know, and, uh, and for the last five years, I've been saying, you know, I've been going, well, I, I quit and here's how I did it and do that and just don't do this, don't do that. And, 
of course, my best got me into a hospital. So I've been praying for him. I, I shut up and, you know, realized that I really don't know. I can't, I mean, I really don't know anything. I, the best I can do for another human being is to pray for him in that case. And he's back in Chicago, and he's been fighting to stay sober. And, and uh, I mean, he's just has had a horrible time, you know, where he's, uh, you know, gotten yanked out of our bars by our dad, you know, trying to keep him sober. Um, anyway, uh, I come to uh, talk to him tonight, and uh, I sent him a sermon on the mount for Christmas. I took a real big leap of faith, you know. And uh, we start talking. He's got eight months. And I, I, I actually was able to say, share with him, I, you know, I got five years on Thursday. And he's like, he genuinely goes, congratulations. You know, first we started relating to each other. For the first, I mean, first time in 30 some odd years. The, um, something that I thought he was doing was, uh, I mean, I try, I had offered all sorts of, uh, things for him to get his license back. I mean, even all sorts of illegal ways years ago. I mean, I just wanted to see the get, get the guy on the road. And what I didn't know what he was doing was for five years, he has been trying to find a God to pray to. You know, he is, it, it just, it knocks me out that this guy's had that much courage to keep, just to keep stumbling around. He has gone and he, and he is, uh, he is somebody that's full of, you know, he's one of the most gifted individuals I've known in my whole life and I couldn't stand to be around him, you know? Um, Oh, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm, when I when I when I uh, first got sober, I started going to therapy. I didn't go to meetings or anything. So, but I went to therapy, and I remember at one point saying, you know, I really, should, really wish I could feel have feelings. So, all I, could, all I could feel is this anger. And then, well, I got what I wanted three years later when I was just like going, God, do I hurt? You know, I just was. That's all I could feel was pain. And uh, I'm sitting here now, and I I don't have a definition for this feeling. It's not an emotion. I I'm just I'm. I am without a doubt like the, the luckiest man. You know, I, I, I now have a brother and it, even if, even if this is the only, this, if, or we don't ever speak again, I've now got a relationship with my brother. You know, um, thanks for being here. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Hi, my name's Darren. I'm an alcoholic. Um, and listening to the, the tapes from the retreat and the ABCs, you talked about, um, the wearing of faces, um, and, and, uh, how, you know, how you were wearing faces. And I, I, I get a little mixed up right there. I, you know, I, is it that, you know, I have the disease of alcoholism and I know I have to treat it in the day I am, that in the day I'm in and that am I always going to have to, in a sense, even though my character is changing, am I always going to have to be on the lookout, so to speak, for the old me? I mean, in the, you know, and, and is that a part of wearing, am I going to be wearing faces or am I going to be rid of wearing faces? Well, I mean, I got a little confused there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, wearing faces is an expression that I use because of the fact that uh, in the beginning I had no way of going except what I could find in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I remain pretty much the same character I've always been, just like Dr. Thibault describes. Is that. Uh, Deep down inside, you know, I was many people to many other people. You know, I would be your friend if I had to be or if it was necessary to be your friend. And then it would be maybe not necessary, I wouldn't be your friend. So I would, one minute you could trust me, the next minute you couldn't trust me. You know, I would change, mood change or favor change, or, you know, and I would, I would be somebody one minute. And the next minute I'd be somebody else. You know, I'd be a liar one minute, the next minute I'd tell the truth. But this became a way of life, how to treat people and how to live in the day I'm in to get what I wanted. This wasn't some condition that couldn't be different or anything else like that. So the purpose of the step application, of course, is that 
the, the principles that are in the steps, the, the honesty, the self-honesty, especially that I talk about, stops me from wearing faces, stops me from favoring you and forgetting him or putting somebody ahead of somebody else and treating them different because I can get more out of them than I can out of the other person. And so it allows me to live at peace of mind. The peace of mind they're talking about the happy, joyous, and free that they mean in the book is happy, joyous, and free for me, my mind, the way it lives, produces, and so on like that. No, this would be, uh, this would not be a program recovery if you had to put up with that all the time. Sometimes be one way and sometimes another way. The program recovery is exactly what it says. It's a recovery from that kind of thinking, that kind of living, or that kind of mind control where you have to keep doing the things you do to certain people and certain other people you do other things for. You can treat the world you're in by one character the character you are, and that in turn means anybody for any reason. See, before everything was on side of me winning or me getting something or or to my favor or whatever it is, but the program recovery was stopped at immediately. The step application, if you notice step four, five, and six are there especially for this what you're talking about right now. So we're at the end of the line. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.